afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure this afternoon. I'm going to be very brief because we've got to get, get him talking. But uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Jim Messier. He's a former major league pitcher. He's also a member of my Toastmasters group. He's, he's a great guy. Our Toastmasters group. And a professional speaker. Uh, he was a major league pitcher for 10 years, and he's going to show you how to break through barriers that block success. His unwavering commitment to succeed under extremely difficult circumstances will inspire you and your team and help you to thrive in a consistently changing environment. I'm sounding like a, a, a car ad, aren't I? <laughs> uh, Re-engage and take a proactive approach and use adversity as an advantage. I'm just going to cut to the chase. Jim was born with one club foot and he had six surgeries to repair it. And so I'm going to let you finish it. Don't and tell I'm going to tell about the story. Oh, okay. I won't. All right. Without further ado, yeah. Mr. Jim is here. I can't. This is too hard. I'm not good enough. Are any of these statements familiar to you? I know at one time or another, one or all of those statements is probably going through your head. And you are not alone. How do we find that mental toughness to overcome adversity? During my career, I faced a lot of challenges. And it happened right before I even started my career. I was born club foot. My right foot was turned in towards my left leg. I had bone abnormalities, tendon and ligament problems, and it took two surgeries to remedy the problem. And when people hear my story, they're amazed that I was able to get to the big leagues, but I think I had more adversity during my career than I ever did trying to realize it. Because I was born with club foot, I overutilized the rest of my body to, to take over for all that instability and strength in my right leg. And what happened is, I had four of the surgeries and many injuries. I totally destroyed my right knee. I have no ACL, Harlan, cartilage, and meniscus. I ruptured my left patella tendon. I broke my right pitching elbow in half. And on two different occasions, I tore the rotator cuff in my right pitching arm. Now, I'm more proud to overcome that adversity than anything else. But I realized after my career, life as adversities were just as difficult to navigate. In 2008, I came home after my career, and I was happy. I was done. I no longer had that anxiety of facing all those hitters, and also the physical exhaustion and pain of all those games. My whole family is healthy. I had three young kids. They're all at the age of five. They gave me no problems. They weren't old enough yet. <laughs> my wife was happy, which is most important. And I thought I was financially set. But then the financial crisis came in 2008. And I watched as my portfolio lost about 40% and realized, oh my God, what am I going to do now? I need a new career. And I had no idea how to do that. And it took a lot of mental toughness. And then I remember a story <coughs> that really inspired me. It's a story of Rudy Rudiger. Yes. Everybody remembers that? Yeah. It was a movie in about the 90s. He was a small, unathletic kid, about five, six hundred sixty-five pounds, and his dream was to play football in Notre Dame. But Rudy also suffered from dyslexia, so his first real battle was just to get into Notre Dame, and he worked real hard. He went to Holy Cross College, and after four different tries, he finally got in. But that was half his battle. He went to Notre Dame, walked on, and was on the practice squad his whole career. But finally, in the last game of his senior year, he got a chance to play. In the last game. He got a sack. He realized his dream. And that was so important to me that in 1998, I actually changed my number to number 45 in honor of Rudy, who wore 45 in Notre Dame. It was that important to me. And it was really the inspiration of that mind control he had to realize his dream. But how do you find that mental toughness to overcome adversity? Well, I believe in my career, I've learned a lot of lessons that I needed to relearn after it was over. I believe those are my ability to suppress anxiety, be relentless in my pursuit, strive for excellence and not perfection, 
And one that's often overlooked and it's pretty easy but you forget is just to put away your pride and ask for help when you need it. Now I played in the major leagues, suppressing anxiety was a lesson I had to learn quickly. Because when I was young and I came up, I was good, I was strong. I could throw the ball hard, I knew where I was going. But a lot of times I would get up on that mound and I would think, oh God, A-Rod's up, he's on fire, he's going to hit me hard. I'd start throwing in the bullpen and I'd throw the ball all over the place and think, how am I going to pitch out there in a the game? The playoffs are coming. I can't blow this. And that really screws with your psyche. It makes it very hard for your potential to come out. Now, if you are a baseball fan, you know the World Series is happening. And if you're paying attention, a lot of the best players in the world are having poor postseasons. Now, some of them might be fatigued, some of them might be injured. But I am willing to bet that a lot of them are failing because the high expectations put on them cannot control their anxiety. And they're worrying, and their anxiety is causing them to lock up physically and mentally, and they cannot do their job. Now, in sports, you probably hear the term choke. And that's definitely what it is. But the joke is you can't perform with both hands wrapped around your neck. But that's, in essence, what you're doing, because you're handicapping yourself. Now, I was very lucky. I learned how to deal with that my first year. I pitched in the playoffs for four years with the Oakland Athletics. And the very first year, I got up into that mound, and I realized that I couldn't change the situation. I got up there and said, you can't throw any harder. You can't have better control, work on new pitches, work on your mechanics. Whatever you have is right now. So you have to deal with the same the situation. You cannot change anything. So you need to forget about the crowd, the media, worries about failure, even the hitter. I took that little white ball that I've thrown all my life, and I thought, okay, there's the hitter. What do I want to do with it? Take the ball, throw it through the glove. And I really made it that simple, even though it's not. But everything after that is really about what's going on in your mind. Because if you're prepared and you're ready to work, then it's just your mind that's stopping you. And you develop scenarios of failure. And then you also go back to the past and remember mistakes that you made. And then you're scared you're going to make them again. And it's just a vicious cycle. Now, after my career, I lost that ability to suppress that anxiety. And Toastmasters was an extremely important part of my journey to regain that. And it really had nothing to do with speech. When I first joined Toastmasters, it was the last thing in the world that I wanted to do. I never really wanted to public speak, probably like a lot of people. You know, I ask people, what are you most scared of? And a lot of people put giving a speech instead of dying. Well, it wasn't that. But it was pretty close. But I started learning a lot of lessons. So when I first joined Toastmasters, the first about four months, I, I really didn't learn that much. And the reason why is I was so worried about giving a speech and how embarrassed I'd be that my wheels were spinning. I wasn't paying as much attention. You know, the Toastmaster would come up and say, all right, everybody, it's time for table topics. I'd be jumping under the desk behind somebody. No, I'm good, thanks. You know, even the first time I signed up for Word of the Day, I remember it took me like a half an hour to prepare. And I was anxious about it. I mean, come on, there's the word, there's the definition, here's a sentence, go ahead. Well, it took me about five speeches to overcome the anxiety. So the first four or five really was about overcoming anxiety more than anything else. After that, I started learning a little more about giving a speech. But that anxiety is really what puts you into trouble. Because I learned that great lesson from Toastmasters, and it helped me in every aspect of my life. Because I finally realized if I can go out there and give a speech in front of a big group of people, and I could do anything else, because this is the last thing I really thought I would ever do. So my other adversities should seem a little easier. Now it really is about mind control. Recently I lost my man card. My wife actually called me on this, I didn't say anything. I was walking around the house, and on the kitchen table, came down and opened up a magazine, and it was the Reverend issue of Oprah magazine. <laughs> she was laughing. What are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. And I just kept looking. <laughs> but I'm glad I did. I found an article that was about mind control. And one of the topics 
was discussing the ability to perform under pressure. And they did a study. They took a group of people. They said, we want you to take this ball and throw it against the target. And we're going to have you fill out two questionnaires. The whole group did this. And they came back. And they told one group, based on, their, on the answers to the questionnaires, that they know that they really perform well under pressure. And the other group, they gave them no specific information about their ability. Then they told both groups to do the same test again. This time, they're going to videotape them. And they're also going to reward them if they're successful by more than 15% from their last throws. And when it was all said and done, the group that they told performed well under pressure reached their goal 90% of the time. And the other group that they gave no information, only 27%. That just shows you how powerful the mind is, how malleable it is. That one little helping point, you know, you're, you do well under pressure. Now 90% succeeded. And it really is amazing how that works. Now you have to think in your past, when you're facing your adversities, how have you felt? How is your mind? What kind of mind control do you have? And I want you to think about the outcomes you have that were unfavorable. Now sometimes, maybe your ability wasn't good enough. Maybe you didn't work hard enough. But the rest of your failures, I'm willing to bet, have come from your inability to control that anxiety. Because when you're facing that adversity, it's okay to be anxious beforehand. But when it's time to face that adversity, that's when you need to shut off that anxiety. Anxiety can be your friend, it can be an en enemy. Anxiety does push you and helps you strive to be better. But if at that time you're facing that adversity and you can't turn it off, you have a greater chance of failure. Next time you're facing that adversity, remember you cannot change the situation. You need to step back, assess the situation, take a deep breath, calm that mind, empty that mind, and attack your adversities. And if you can control your mind, then you're better able to attack your adversities with no regrets. Now, as a little kid, I had to learn the lesson to be relentless early on. I was born with club foot, so I was different. And I really didn't notice it as part of athletics too much, but I noticed it because I was different. I could see my leg was shaped different than everybody else. I was a different kid. And as I got older and I became very good at baseball, I started hearing whispers from coaches, scouts, because I really separated myself from other players. But I would hear things like, you know what, I'm watching on the mound, he's limping around, his mechanics aren't, they aren't proper. He also doesn't throw the right kind of pitches. But I proved them wrong. It was because I was relentless. I went out there every day and I worked on my mechanics. And I did it in ways that weren't even the way they wanted me to do it. It wasn't the proper way, but I knew I was totally different. My abilities were different, that I had to find a way that worked best for me, and I did. And they told me, you, know, you can't throw your school ball. And that was my signature pitch. See, when I was younger, even as I got older, I couldn't throw the normal curveball slider that most pitchers do. I had to find my own way, so I developed a screwball, which is a very unorthodox pitch that hardly any right-handers throw. And the scouts would come and say, you know, that pitch is kind of gimmicky. Right-handers, it's going to go right into the bat and they're going to kill it. But I proved them wrong. It's because I was relentless. Later in my career, after all those injuries and surgeries, I knew my ability was going straight downhill. And there was nothing really I could do about it. Now, pitching in the big leagues is hard at 100%. So how is that going to do it at 75%? I knew every day was just going to be a battle to keep it at that 75%. So I knew there was a couple things I needed to work on. And that was my intelligence and my mental toughness. Now the intelligence was easy. Every time I was out of the game, I would just watch videotape and see the strengths and fitnesses of all the, all the hitters in my league. And I would study them. And it helped me immensely. But the mental toughness was a lot harder. And at that point, I had to be relentless. Every day recognize where my emotions were because every day I wanted to quit. I felt like I couldn't do it. There was no way I had enough physical ability to continue on in my career. But I was relentless. Now that ability to be relentless has been not following after my career. You do become soft and you have no path. You don't know where to go. 
and I played baseball, I had a clear path. I knew what I was supposed to do, and I could see the end of the road. After baseball, I realized I have an economics degree and a baseball resume. No one's going to be handing me a job. No computer skills, no business skills, no communication skills. What did I have to do? I had to be relentless. I had no idea what was going on. So the greatest thing happened. Somebody just told me, you know what? Start from the beginning. Take baby steps. There's a career resource saying in Lake Forest, go over there. Okay, I don't know what to do. I'll just do it. And I went over there, had a mentor. He told me, you know, work on your strengths, weaknesses, your likes, dislikes, find what career path is good for you, your resume, interviewing. And I learned some important information. But I felt like I wasn't really on the right path. And I realized I need computer skills. So I went to my mentor and said, look, you have a coach for me. I need to be computer proficient. He got me a computer coach, and I did. But she taught me something even more important. She referred me to LinkedIn. I went on LinkedIn, built up my profile, my contacts, st started networking. Somebody would say, you know, Jim, you're a professional baseball player. Maybe you could parlay that into a sales job. I said, okay. Got some more help. Somebody said, well, if you're going to be in the sales force, you're going to be working in communication skills. I was kind of offended by that. What are you talking about? I played professional baseball. I was on TV. I got interviewed. I know how to do this. And then I realized I'm a middle reliever. The only time anybody talks to me is when I'm doing bad. So my interviews kind of went like this. Hey, Jim, you're winning 3-2 in the eighth inning, and you gave up a two-run homer. What happened? <laughs> Tongue in cheek. It wasn't very good today. I elevated the ball, and he hit it hard. And that was pretty much the extent of my communication skills. <laughs> so I knew I needed to work on it. And somebody else from my network, probably about Toastmasters. They had clubs all over the country. Find the one nearest to you and join. Okay, so I looked on the website, saw a Club 169, Long Grove, Lake Zurich, and I joined. And I've been there for about three years, and it's opened up many different opportunities for me. At this present time, now I'm trying to start my own speaking business, but I'm also a general partner in an investment company. Now, if you would have asked me four years ago if I was going to do any of these things, I'd say, no way. It was impossible. It was not even on my radar. Neither one of these things were something that I wanted to do whatsoever. But it happened because I was relentless. I knew I didn't know where I was going, what I was doing. So I had to do something. Because if you do something, it opens up all kinds of opportunities. If you don't do anything, that means you're not willing to change. And there are no opportunities. Opportunity will not come to you. You have to go to opportunity. And just think about on. Think about your lives, your past, and the goals that you have. Maybe some of you have accomplished them. Maybe some of you exceed them. I bet you a lot of you, maybe you're happier than your original goal, but it's something totally different. And that's because of the opportunities that came up in your life. So you always need to be aware you have to move forward even if it's small. Sometimes those little small steps lead to an all-out sprint. Be relentless because there's opportunities <laughs> everywhere. Now, how do you deal with those opportunities? Are you a hard worker? Are you a closer, starter? Are you a perfectionist? <laughs> I learned in my life, and I believe, that you need to strive for excellence and not perfection. And baseball taught me that right away. Being a middle reliever, I always come into a game feeling like if I give up one run, I'm going to lose it. So it's hard not to be perfect. And when you see that home plate, it looks very small from the pitcher's mouth. It looks very hard to hit that strike zone, especially if you're trying to throw that perfect pitch on a corner. Now, it would be great if you could do it, but I'm a human being. I make mistakes. I'm not a pitching machine. I can't do it all the time. So what happens is when I start thinking perfect and I want to make that perfect pitch, a couple things happen. Number one, I have a tendency to aim the ball. I tighten up because it's such a small zone that I aim the ball at the target. Number two, there's that whole area around there that's a ball. So even if I'm almost perfect just around that area, it's going to be a ball. I have more chance of walking a guy and falling behind the count, which makes the hair have an easier opportunity to get a hit. Not only that, if you think about it, that hitter does not care if I think the pitch is perfect. They're professional hitters. They can hit anything they want. Our job is to make sure the percentage of hits goes down. 
And how do you do that? By being consistent in the strike zone, not perfect. So being a pitcher, really, excellence is all about being around that zone and not throwing that perfect pitch all the time. Now, if, if you think about perfection, you have to realize there's no way you're ever going to get there. We are human. We can't have perfection. So if we can't have perfection, then really, are you ever succeeding? Do you feel that way? If you think about perfection, there's really no way that you're going to succeed. And what happens? Your confidence wavers because there's no real feeling of success. I recently had to relearn that lesson. Everybody's looking at me, so I'm supposed to say something else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've really seen you learn that situation. I know where I learned it. I learned it in the speech class. My teacher's name was Linda Brakel. She told me many wonderful things about getting a speech, but the most important lesson she taught me was excellence over perfection. And she meant it in the context of giving a speech. I believe that if you make mistakes, that it's okay. Because you seem more human, you're more relatable to your audience. But she also believed if you're accepting of mistakes, then they're that much easier to deal with. They don't put you over the edge. You recognize the mistake, and then you move on. Now, it really helped me when I was giving my speech, as I told you before in Toastmasters, my biggest problem was that anxiety for a long period of time. But her lesson helped me realize that I can make those mistakes and still move forward. Now, I don't know how many speeches I've given so far, but I can't remember one where it's gone exactly the way I scripted. So I've made a mistake every time. But so what? You move on and you deal with it. And I just gave you a great example because I really didn't forget where it was in my presentation. But so what if I had it? I didn't see anybody walk out. You didn't boo me. But Troop tomorrow is not going to say, you see your blows presentation. <laughs> So you really have to be willing to make that little bit of a mistake. You know, think about your own life. Are you perfectionist? Are you scared to make that mistake? Do you ever perceive anything as a success? If you don't live up to your expectations, then how are you going to be mentally tough? Mistakes are okay. Everybody strives to be the best. But the best make mistakes too. The best just handle them and deal with them and learn from them. Battling adversity can seem like a really long and lonely war. But it doesn't have to be. You really need to just reach out and ask for help. It sounds so simple. But I think it's important to me because I didn't learn that lesson until later on. And there's help everywhere. You have your friends, you have your family, you have your network. You might get help from a friend of a friend of a friend. Somebody you never met might give you the best help or the best advice that you've ever received. Help is all over the place. The important thing is you just need to ask. It took me a long time to learn this lesson because during my career, baseball was my passion. I was an expert at it. And I had coaches all the way up through the ranks. And help was right there any time I wanted. After my career, when I didn't have that path and have a goal, I had no idea what I was doing. But it took me a long time. I languished in self-pity for a while before I realized, you know what, you need some help. You have to ask. But it came from all over. You know, I got that great emotional support from family and friends. But I got a lot of the most important help from outside my real sphere of influence. I actually got it, a lot of it from Club 169 Long Road Lake Zurich. The lovely Ellen Schnurr, she's probably gone right now. She helped me with website, videos. She also gave me a kick in the butt once in a while when I needed to get going. Glenn Roberts and Michelle Cable. Got me some speaking opportunities. And the rest of the group was just wonderfully supportive. But I realized that I needed that help. There was no way I could get through it on my own. And I'm very sorry that I just turned this speech into a commercial for Club 169, but you know, you guys put me up on the podium, so I'm on. 
So you need that support. You can't go at it alone. Battling adversity really is a team sport. So next time you are battling, remember just to ask for that little bit of help. You know, Battling adversity is definitely a difficult prospect. There's no doubt about it. But you can simplify the process. You just gotta realize everybody is different. We all have different abilities, different strengths. So what an adversity that's difficult for me might not be that difficult for you. But it is about controlling that mind. And you never know where the next adversity is going to come from. But there's one thing you can do. You can stay out of your own way. Find that mind control. If you are planned, practiced, and prepared, then the only thing that's really standing in your way is you. You need to learn and practice mind control so that you can better face your adversities with no regrets. I don't know who I'm supposed to talk to now. Yeah. <laughs> Ellen? Still got at least 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. First, I saw a hand come up back here. Can you hear me? Yes. Since you said you pitched for um, the Oakland A's and during their postseason, obviously they were either in the World Series or on the way to the World Series. Because you also said you were so afraid afterwards to speak publicly, would, would you have been afraid or were you afraid if you were offered to go into the broadcasting side out there in California, either on the radio or on TV? You know, I think that would have been a different story. I think it would have been difficult just because there's a lot of air to fill, and, you know, watching games and, and knowing what's going on in baseball. A lot of the time, those guys are experts, and they really mess up a lot because they got to fill that air and they just start talking. But I still think that's different because when it's a strength and you have information right in front of you, and you're not rehearsing something and giving it in front of a big group of people. It's totally different. You're just sitting in a box, just like playing baseball. If there's 50,000 fans yelling and cheering and they're against me. It really didn't bother me that much. This is definitely more intimidating than pitching in front of 50,000 fans. Wow. Another question. Let's side of the room. Anyone? Yeah. Nope. Over here. Sir. Yes. What tricks did you find work most effectively for you to control your mind? You talked about controlling your anxiety. Control. How did you control your anxiety? What ways did you find that worked for you? Well, there's a, a lot of people like to work with mantras, you know, they, they're really telling themselves they can do it, they know they can do it, you know, I don't know if anybody ever saw Saturday Night Live a long time ago, I think it was, what was his name? Stuart I'm good enough, everybody likes me. That doesn't work for me. So I never do that because I almost feel like I'm fooling myself, I almost feel like it's a joke, you know, where you can do this, but that's me. So for me, I know when I'm, when I'm coming up to adversity, that is it. I, I, I get on that, so we'll just talk about the mound. I'm getting on that mound, and right at that point I go, okay, what are you doing with the ball? There's a glove, just throw it. And I just really empty my mind of everything. Because the other way, you know, to me it's all about getting rid of that negative voice. So the confidence comes is when I can just empty my mind and let myself, let my ability shine through. Because if you ever think about it, think of some time when you've succeeded and you were at 100%, everything was going well. It's almost like you're on autopilot. I had plenty of games in a row where it felt like I'd just go out there, take the ball, and go right back, and I would get guys out. 
and it was just because there was no negative voice in my head telling me that I couldn't do it. Okay. One more, Jim? Whatever, whatever time we have, it's up to you guys. First, I'd like to thank you for sharing your story with us. And also, um, the question I have is, what do you do when you get tired of being tired? <laughs> tired of being tired? I don't really even know what you mean because I'm never tired. <laughs> what do you mean tired of being tired? I can find it. When you have tried it over and over again, and it's just not working, and you keep going back, you don't know, at first off, you don't know how to give up. Right. Well, it depends what, it depends what your adversity is. I mean, a lot of mine, I was already there. I needed to do this. I couldn't just quit. You know, quitting would have meant saying, I can't pitch you tomorrow, I'm really hurt, faking an injury, saying I'm done. So that would be quitting. And I, would, I had too much pride to do that. And I also had too much pride where I wasn't going to go out there and get my butt handed to me all the time. So I knew I just had to keep going and going. And when I was younger with the club foot, I just loved baseball. I never really thought I was going to be a professional baseball player. That was a dream. And I know nowadays it's kind of changed. Kids and parents think they're a kid. He's really good. He's going to be in the pros. It wasn't like that when I was a kid. It was go play and have fun. And then by the time I got late high school, college, then it was a thought that I might have a chance. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Coming up there. Hang on. I'd like to give something back to you. Um, as you talked about your anxiety, you talked about assess, breathe, calm your mind, ABC. Your D is do it. So you now have ABCD on anxiety. <coughs> <laughs> Maybe you should do this. <laughs> Anybody else? Any more questions? Uh, come. kid, even though I had the club foot, I was tremendously athletic. My parents knew right away. I played everybody else's sport better than them, not just baseball. So <laughs> athletics was a little easier. Also, when I was growing up, I was a shy kid. I'm mean, even now not much of an attention getter. So I don't need people to look at me. And growing up, I was very good at science, math. Didn't like English too much. Communication was not my cup of tea. I was like, oh, I don't, you know, Spanish? You know, I recognize the vocabulary and take the test and do all right, but he asked me to speak, I was like, I have no idea what you're saying. So it's also based on your strengths. So the lessons I learned from baseball helped me recognize what I needed to do when something wasn't my strength. And also, I guess when you're born with something, you don't know any better, and there's pain and things that happen to you. So my pain tolerance is tremendously high. I recognize that after my career. Things happen to me, you know, I'll be in the yard working, and I'll cut myself in my life, but I, What's going on with you? I wouldn't even—I didn't even realize. You know, so it's just things happen that no, it's okay. It just—it's also getting used to it and experiencing it. All right. Well, that's good. I want to—I want to commend you for your effort. I am so happy that you didn't give up because it's a lot of people that have this ability and they have not given up and they have the same real power you have, and that's a good example you set. Thank you. Thank you. Step that you took in order for you to succeed. Because I understand you're doing well now with your financial 
whole thing is that is a new business. It's really not that it's booming. But the point is, after my career, when I thought I was retired, I wasn't doing much. I was watching my kids grow up, enjoying that. When the time came when I realized I needed a career, I started going through all these steps. And basically, I was just saying that I didn't know where I was going to lead, but I did small little things that got me to where I am now, even though that wasn't part of my goal whatsoever. So it's also about hope, because if you're trying to do new things or you're, you're following a goal, you might never reach that goal, but it might be something else that's even more worthwhile because there's different opportunities as long as you're pushing forward and doing something. Are you religious? Am I religious? Yeah. No, I am a... I don't even know what you're calling me. I'm <laughs> <laughs> a hopeful. It's a hopeful. An agnostic. <laughs> I do. I do belong to a church. Uh, it's more through my wife's side. <laughs> so I, I go and attend and I hope. <laughs> Jim, thanks for coming today. I'm Pete Russell from JSC Toastmasters. Can you tell me or tell the crowd three or four things that you learned in Toastmasters that's helped you through transition and get over the hump that's made you a better speaker or a better interviewer or clarified what you want to do? What was it exactly in Toastmasters that really helped you out? Well, one is just the anxiety, and that's no doubt. That's right from the beginning. Like I said before, I really, if, if you had told me four years ago, all right, Jim, right now we're going to go put you in that room, there's, I don't know, 100 people, I have no idea, and you're just going to talk for a minute. I might have just turned town around and said, nope, not doing it, see you later. <laughs> and just that ability to come in, and they were so helpful and supportive, and I overcame that anxiety. And the leaders in the club, you know, after evaluation, they would just come over and say, you know, hey, if you would just not pace, you know, your, your vocal tone. And they just helped out so much just because uh, they're, you know, experts. They are, they have more, um, they have more experience than I am. So, you know, I can't even speak. I don't even have vocabulary. <laughs> I think it's also the ability to write. You're going home and you're trying new things, and you're developing new speeches, and it really helps you with your creativity. Because just coming up with those stories, I had a lot of fun, and it, and it motivated me to deliver more speeches. I don't know if anybody remembers when they first joined, and you know, the first couple of speeches, not only was I scared to deliver a speech, I was like, God, what, what am I going to talk about? <laughs> and it took me a while, I'm like, God, I don't even know what to do here. I'm not, I don't really want to give a speech, but I can't anyway, because I don't have any ideas. <laughs> So finally I sat down and I just looked at the whole manual. All right, what has happened in your life? Let's make this fun. And I just started going through life situations, things with my kids, whatever, my career. And it really helped my creativity because I'm not particularly a creative person, but this really helped me. So I think those are probably the three things that I've learned the most from those things that helped me along the way. You make it personal. I was there when you talked about the kids and the car trip. <laughs> Anybody else? Hi. Um, thank you for everything. Thank you for your speech here. Um, I'd like to know, did you have to deal with other individuals who told you you couldn't do this and you couldn't do that? And if you did, how did you overcome that and any anxiety that could be from it? I heard that a lot, but the thing through baseball, it was rarely to my face. It was more a roundabout way. But there were a couple times, you know, especially as I got further along. Um, like I said, I didn't pitch like everybody else. I was totally different because I didn't even land in the same spot. My mechanics were way off, so I had to do everything different. But I would throw certain pitches, and coaches say, you can't do that. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? That's what I do and say, no, you got to do it like this. And I knew, so really what I would do is I would just, when I saw them, I would try it their way, and then I'd go back to my way. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, you know, it's all, it's about luck, too. Uh, the, the best success I ever had was in 1997. I got traded, by, I got picked up by the Tampa Bay Del Rays in the expansion draft. And I got to that team, and Larry Rothschild was the manager at the time, some of you probably know him, he's in Chicago fans. And he 
told me, you have the experience that no one else on the team has because everybody was young. Go out there and you got the job. You don't have to do anything. Go out there and pitch and get better. And it really helped me because he didn't tell me to do anything. I went out there and I relearned again. I'm like, okay, this is what I can do. And I learned a couple different pitches. And in a month, I, was, I learned more than I did in the last six years. So it was about experimenting. And I know what you're saying because I don't know if you're talking about like a boss telling you you can't do something. That's a tough thing because some of them are my boss and I have to say, okay. And pretend like I'm trying, but I don't know if you can do that in your profession. But, <laughs> and my, I just, you, know, you take everything in, and there's certain things I listen to, and certain things I just said, you know what, I can't do it that way. And certain things I knew I knew better because it's my body. I knew what I could do. Jim, did you offer to consider the fact that you just had a blessed? And that there's someone, a higher being, that truly is looking out for you, and it sounds to me that you have it. Pretty put together well, and you're taking your steps one step at a time, and you're doing really well. And Toastmasters, everybody knows it's a wonderful thing. It just helps you in everything, but your life sounds like someone else is, is looking down on you. That's all that, I would tell be, you. that would be wonderful. And that would be, that's how I'm I just don't know because there's many times, just like anybody else, where you're like, I have no clue what I'm doing, where I am. Really? Well, you got to think if you're. You're a professional baseball player for 10 years, and then you think you've accomplished your dream, whatever you want to do, and you're ready, you're set for life, and then one day you recognize, okay, I want to live the way I'm living right now, my family the way they're accustomed to, and I have no idea how to do that. And then you're totally lost, because you can't throw a baseball anymore. And then you go into a place like a career resource center that's really for you know, people that have lost their jobs, or a college kid that's just come out of college that's trying to figure out his way. So that was a big kick in the butt too, going there, going, what am I doing? I was pitching in the playoffs. Now I'm learning how to write resumes like I am 17 years old. So there's a lot of steps and there's a lot of things you have to do before you start feeling it. And the journey's still not over, so we'll see. that I love, dearly love, have been affected by health issues. And uh, one day I was with Michelle Cable, and we talked about the survivalists. And I said, I don't want to survive, Michelle. I, I really don't. I, if it comes because so many people that I love are on anti-rejection drugs, and it shocked her. I can deal with the big things. It's the slow and steady that I respect in you. Every day, getting up there looking at those tough faces and having grace every day. That's the difference. That's your gift. And we applaud it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.